Good morning. Good morning. Oh gosh, wake up, guys. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you are in the Lord's house, and it is a good day to be here. I know I'm excited to be here. All sorts of good stuff, things are going on, I tell you. So I got a few announcements because we do have a lot of cool things going on. What's right after church? Oh, nope. What's that right after church today? Camp, summer camp meeting. So right after church, I'm going to head straight to the fellowship hall. We have Chris from the Indiana United Methodist Church coming from the camp group, camping group. He's going to tell you about the camps. We're, um, Paul and I are going to set up a couple of PCs, uh, laptops there. That way, if anybody wants to go ahead and register there, and we've got the whole process for you laid out, okay? So right after church, head that way. For those who are wanting to sign up for camp so you can learn some more. Um, also, we've got a real thrill coming. Um, well, first of all, tentatively this Friday, we're going to go to Bloomington to Beth Shalom to a Jewish congregation and go to Shabbat with them. Okay? Everybody here is invited to join us if you would like to go on this tour and then have the rabbi talk to you for 20 minutes afterwards. And the information is in the bulletin. There's a catch. Anthony's on the basketball team. Sectional is Wednesday night. If they win that, we're going to have to move that to later in the month, okay? Because he's got to be at sectional. And so we'll be moving that around, okay? So, um, so on top of that, if you guys want to support Anthony, raise your hand, Anthony, for those who don't know who Anthony is. If you want to support Anthony, 6 o'clock, Hanover, this Wednesday, Greg's covered it, and I'm coming too. Okay? So we're real excited about that. Um, so the confirmation field trip, look at the midweek. It has more information. For those of you online, you're invited too. I just need to know if you're coming. Because we've got to give them heads up how many people. Okay? Um, and we have the contest during Lent. <coughs> over here. And the kids put the buckets on here. Just to let you know where we are right now. Remember, this is where we're doing the boys against the girls. Girl, boys have $65.10. Girls are at $70. So, you may, the boys may want to go put a little money in, okay? Remember, it's men and boys. So right now, that's our contest and where it's at at the time. And then at Easter, we'll tell you who the winner is and we'll get everything all laid out for that. But it's for Heifer International. And we put more information on that in the midweek also. <coughs> and we have another blanket. I hadn't mentioned this to anybody. I wish I probably should have to get her on the prayer list. My Aunt Marie has not been well for about a week or so. Actually, last weekend, we were balancing Abby and what was happening with Aunt Marie and keeping my dad involved. So yesterday, we went to go visit my Aunt Marie at rehab. And she fell a couple of times. So this prayer blanket <coughs> is for her, and I'm going to mail it to her. Okay, so we know how to do this, don't we? We know how to do it. And the people who are online, you put your hands out too, okay? You put your hands out too. But this is for my Aunt Marie. Are we ready? Let's pray over this blanket. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you in praise. People in our church took the time to select fabric, Pray over this project, sew this blanket, pray while they're sewing the project, and pray over it afterwards. And here we are praying over it again to ask a special blessing upon this prayer blanket. Every time my Aunt Marie picks it up, may she feel the love of this church. May she feel your presence very deeply. And anyone else who picks it up and her family or whatever, may they also... Feel your presence. Because, Lord, we know these blankets are very special. Repeatedly, I get calls how much they mean to people. And they mean a lot to them because of you, Lord. It's a symbol that reminds them that you are with them. So, Lord, we ask a special blessing upon this blanket today. In Jesus' name, we humbly pray. Amen. Thank you for doing that with me. I greatly appreciate it. I know she will greatly appreciate it. 
And a last thing, if you've not worshipped with us before, those online especially, if you've not worshipped with us before, we are a church that believes in the power of prayer. It's the most powerful weapon in our arsenal, and it's actually the foundation of our vision. And you're going to hear more about our vision here as we keep developing it out. So during worship, you're going to hear prayers shared that specifically ask God, invite God into the sanctuary, into our lives, into the lives of this church to open new doors, new possibilities. So we are asking for that direction, and we are asking to give up our wills for God's will. Sounds so simple in words, doesn't it? A lot harder to really do. So, we are surrendering our own desires and preferences in order to make room for what God can bring. So at this time, it's that time when we quiet down, we get seated in our seats and get comfortable. All the things on our minds this morning, all the things we were preparing, getting together, wrap them up, stick them on a box, stick them on a shelf. And then, during the prelude, as Judy shares her gift, we are going to be preparing our hearts and mind for worship as the kids come through. It's going to be Michael and Brooklyn today. As the kids come through and bring the light of Christ into the world. If you guys will help me do the responsive Lenten call to worship. Bless the Lord, God of Israel. Because of our God's deep compassion, the dawn from heaven will break upon us. To give light to those who are sitting in darkness, to guide us on the path of peace. 
Bless the Lord who lifts up the lowly and fills the hungry with good things. Who calls all people and seeks the outsiders, outcasts, and outlaws. Bless the Lord God of Israel. And now if you'll join me in the Lenten prayer of confession. Lord God, as we search our hearts through the season of Lent, we confess that we have sinned. We have turned away from those in need. We have not lifted the lowly. We have strayed from your will. We have failed to do the things you have called us to do. We have looked on others with judgment rather than compassion. Forgive us, we pray. Lift us out of our sin and fill our hearts with your goodness and love. See us as we are. Show us mercy and remember us today as we surrender our wills for your will, your dreams, your hopes, and your possibilities. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. And now for words of assurance. Hear the good news. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, and there is joy in heaven when even one sinner repents. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Please stand for our opening song. And now we'll go to the invitation for tithes and offering. As God so freely offers us with the gift of life in Jesus Christ, let us respond with gratitude, offering our lives to God. Would the ushers please come forward to collect the tithes and offerings?
Thanksgiving for your tithes and offerings. We give you thanks and praise, O God, for the free and abundant gift of grace you have given us in Jesus Christ. Let the simple gifts of our lives be a sign of our unending gratitude for your undying love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. go to the prayer of illumination. God, open our hearts and minds to receive your word. Thank you for your faithful servants who have handed down to us sound instruction and a trustworthy witness to your son, Jesus Christ. As the, skip, as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, grow within our hearts a love for your son and a willingness to follow him. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and give us confidence in what you teach us today. Speak to us, Lord, and do not hold back, for we, your children, are listening. Amen. And the first morning scripture comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 7 and 10 through 13. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Now at the time of the incense offspring, the whole assembly of people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you will name him John. And our scripture this morning continues in the Gospel of Luke. And yes, I do know it's Lent. It's not Christmas time. But we are going to be continuing in Luke. Luke 1, 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God, and now your relative Elizabeth is in her old age, has conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. 
the word of God for the people of God. You know, today we start a new series on, in Luke for Lent. It's based on the materials of a Bible study that we've got a small group doing. Um, I've got a Bible study happening on Tuesday nights on this. It's by Adam Hamilton. It's Luke, Jesus, and the outsiders, outcasts, and outlaws. Therefore, much of the message today I'll be pulling at different times from the material from Adam Hamilton. And we'll stay in this series all the way up to Easter, okay? But before we begin, i got something to share with you. You know, I, in my family, I'm the youngest of three. Many of you know that. My sister Debbie is the oldest. Thirteen months later, my sister Linda was born. And then three years later, they were pregnant again. This pregnancy was their last try to have a baby boy. You've got to understand, my mother had lost, had a few miscarriages before she even had Debbie. So this was going to be their last try for a baby boy. And they had me, and I know some of you don't know me real well, but surprise, I'm not a boy. <laughs> In case you weren't aware. And I anticipate there was a little bit of a disappointment there because my dad really, really, really wanted a boy. He got me. Anyway, but like most families, they have several children. You know, there's all sorts of pictures of my sisters, my two older siblings, right? I mean, this happens all the time, doesn't it? Um, and then when the third one came around, eh, a family photo once in a while. I very rarely see a picture of just me, unless it's a school picture. Okay? But that's normal. I mean, honestly, that's very normal. We do this as parents, don't we? We don't mean to. We just slow down the picture taking. The more kids we've got to take pictures of. Well, like most families that have several children, that's what happened there. And You know, while parents really don't have favorites, and I really do believe we try not to have favorites, the birds of a feather do flock together. So if um, the husband is really into fishing. And maybe they have a son who really gets into fishing. Well, they're gonna hang around together more, right? If you have a little girl that likes to play in the dirt and their mother likes to garden, well, they're probably gonna hang around together more, okay? When my family, my sister Debbie was pretty close to my dad, they had more in common. My sister Linda had more in common with my mom, so she you know, hung with my mom more. I was kind of in the middle. It really didn't fit either way. It didn't really scar me. I think actually what made me independent. Um, this really didn't fit in one of those categories. But you know, like most siblings, and any of you who've had siblings, I anticipate the Sunberries ran into this all the time. <laughs> you know, when you're older, say you're eight or nine, you really don't want your five-year-old sister hanging around, especially if you go play with your friends. Am I right? You guys remember that? Okay. Well, Paul, no one ever wanted you hanging around. But anyway, <laughs> <clears throat> you know, it's like I, I love to play. You know, our, our neighborhood was a special place. And as you went down the road, we had a lot of kids. We had the good pay pastors over on this side. If you know Tim Good Pastor, I grew up with Tim Good Pastor. Okay? His sister Mike is the same age as my sister Debbie. His, he is the same age as my sister Linda. The little brother Pat is the same age as me. Hellman's down the road. The two older sisters were the same age as my two older sisters, and the little brother Kevin was the same age as me. But then we had several families that didn't have anybody in my age range, but they had them in my sisters and above. And Adrian and Tim Hardwick were two of those, okay? And if you went down the road and turned the curve, there was Mix. Mix were like the Sunberries. They had plenty of kids, okay? And they had a big field next to their house. And guess what they used the field for? To play baseball. That's where the kids gathered to play baseball. When I was five, I wanted to go so bad. And finally, my mom said, girls, take your sister with you. 
You can just imagine their faces. Oh, we got to take her with us. So they take me with me, and I'm sure they were much more gracious than that, you know, but they took me with them to the ball field, and what do you think everybody else thought? Man, we came to play ball, not babysit your little sister, you know? But I tell you what happened. <clears throat> I remember feeling I didn't quite belong there. I remember that... It was just one of the places I wasn't warmly welcomed. They're not terrible people. Come on in, guys. They're not terrible people. I was just five. I mean, seriously, what are they going to do with me? Does anybody else here have any memories of a time when you just really felt you didn't belong, you were an outcast, you were someone that they didn't want to have there? Has anybody else had that, those memories of something like that at some time in their life? Seen a lot of heads nodding and some hands up. Well, <clears throat> keep that memory, because we're going to come back to it in a minute, okay? So before we dig into the scripture, I just want to review a little bit about the Gospel of Luke. We were actually in it last year, so some of it's already familiar. I've told you before, it's my favorite gospel. Even in the scripture itself, in the very beginning, it says... It is a well-ordered account, as stated in Luke 1.3. I like organization and order. So it just speaks to me. I like this. I love this. I love Luke. But also, it's well-loved by many people because it contains some of our favorite stories and parables that you don't find anywhere else. You realize that? In Luke is where... Zacchaeus climbs up in a tree. In Luke is when we hear about the prodigal son. In Luke, we have the road to Emmaus. And we also have Gabriel visiting Zechariah. And this is where we usually see Mary's Annunciation. What do we do every Christmas? We pull open Luke. And you probably do this at home, too. Open Luke 2 and read it as part of your Christmas festivities. But one thing in particular sticks out when I look at Luke. The entire book, when you read it, the entire book, what the writer is emphasizing is Jesus' appeal to outsiders, outcasts, and outlaws. You know, those on the margins, those who are broken, those who are unseen, those who are alone, those who feel like they're second class, even those who feel they are beyond loved and beyond being saved, we see them in Luke, and Jesus is drawn towards them. And they are drawn towards Jesus. And God proves in those scripture that that's some of God's favorite people. We see it. You see it? And we start with Zechariah and Elizabeth. You know, Zechariah and Elizabeth were childless, right? We all know this story. We've heard it multiple times. They were childless. And back then, infertility was not well understood. So whose fault was it? It was a woman's fault. She's barren. It was a woman's fault. So she was bearing the shame of, I'm never going to be able to have a child. And then the two of them were seen as not having God's favor. Oh, you don't have God's favor. Now, but in the scripture, it clearly makes it clear they were righteous, they were faithful. So that wasn't true. They did have God's favor. And they were very old. We see that in the scripture. You know, that's kind of vague. You know, when you're young, old can be 25. As you get older, it moves up to like 60. And then as you get older, it's like 200. <laughs> But in the Bible, whenever you go read different verses of the Bible, you can be, between, be to anywhere between 60 and 80 and be considered very old. It's just based on what it is. And so you've got to remember, Zechariah and Elizabeth were considered, quote, very old. And despite their age, they are chosen to be the parents of John the Baptist. As we age, sometimes we get the impression we aren't of much value, don't we? especially as our body starts to give up on us a little bit. 
Maybe we can't do what we used to be able to do. I anticipate Zechariah climbed a little slower up the steps of the temple at this time. I anticipate Elizabeth, when she got up off her knees, took her a little bit more time to get it done. You know, as we age, sometimes we also feel pushed to the margins. Sometimes we push ourselves to the margins, saying, I can't do as much, so I'm gonna, not going to do it at all. And sometimes we even have the illusion that we're a burden to somebody, don't we? Sometimes we feel like we don't belong anymore. So if you look at this from a different viewpoint, this is what I love about God. Maybe God purposely chose Elizabeth and Zechariah because of their age and everything that came with it. Someone from the margins needed to bear John the Baptist. And this has happened before, hasn't it? Abraham and Sarah, does anybody remember how old Abraham and Sarah was? And you can't say anything, Ed. Does anybody remember how old Abraham and Sarah was? 190 when they had Isaac, okay? They, they fit in that very old category of the biblical readings, okay? <clears throat> also, Moses was 80 when he was called to lead, lead the Israelites out of Egypt. He moved a little slower than he used to. Still did it. And Zechariah and Elizabeth were just who they needed to be called at that important time. And you know, you even see this in our churches. How many times have you heard me mention, I know at one time you used to be able to do this much, but now you can only do this much. Do this much. Because you've got five people doing this much, you've got this much. You still can contribute in the church. You still are important. You have wisdom, experience, things that others don't have. You know, Adam Hamilton puts it this way. We never retire from the work that God calls us to do. And in whatever stage of life we find ourselves, God is still seeking to use us. Well, God was ready to partner with Zechariah and Elizabeth. They had the right faith, they had the right skills, and they had a love to raise John the Baptist. The fact that they were older had no problem involved with that. But then we go on in Luke 2, you know, the part that I read about Mary, right? We don't just see God using older adults, we also see the opposite side of the spectrum. Mary had to be 13 or 14, somewhere around there. A young girl, she was engaged to be married. Now, don't worry, this was kind of normal in that time frame, to be engaged to be married at 13 or 14. Anthony, how old are you? Dina, how old is Emily? That's what I thought. Jesus' mother would have been in middle school this day and age. Have we ever thought about that? In middle school. She would have been in middle school. Now, if you have someone in middle school, are they the first person you think of when you want to give an important task to someone? They aren't. They aren't the first one you think of, do they? Nope. To be honest, I had a son, and I remember when he was 15, and there was a lot of things I didn't want to give him that was important because it wasn't going to happen. About 15, that flipped, but... To be honest, we really would not look at a middle, middle school student to be the person to do an important task, a very weighty task. We often dismiss them as naive, inexperienced. Hey guys, when I was in seminary, that's how I felt about the 20 year olds in seminary. Inexperienced and naive, and boy did they prove me wrong. If the people I went to seminary with ran, ran our world, I'd be perfectly happy. They were so talented, so they had so many great ideas. Even Timothy had this problem. Ageism happens on both sides of the spectrum, doesn't it? Even on the young. Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy, encouraging him, don't listen to what they say about your lack of experience. I know your faith. Well, God often does things opposite of what the culture of that time would expect. Choosing young adults. David was young when he defeated Goliath. Esther was young when she became queen of Persia and had to make a major decision that saved her people. 
and Mary was young when she was asked to bear God's son. Do any of you know of someone who was called to do something significant at a very young age? I have a nephew who wants to be an astronaut. This is not, I like to put on the outfit and run around and have, you know, a cape behind me type stuff. He will be an astronaut. He's been at Cape Canaveral. He has done all sorts of things. He's went balloon, balloon um, uh, crewing with us before. He'll be an astronaut, I have no doubt. How about you, Greg? He'll definitely be in the space program. He'll be in the space program. Smart as a whip, too. Scary smart. But he knew as a young child he wanted to do this. Greg and I had a pastor at one time that knew he had the call into ministry at 15. That still blows my mind. 15. God still calls people who are young. The very old, the very young, even though those groups often get dismissed, they don't feel like they belong. Sometimes they don't feel like they're enough because they've been told so many times they aren't smart enough, they're not experienced enough. Adam Hamilton put it this way, and I really like this, so I wanted to share it. God's choice of the old and the young illustrates Jesus' appeal to the outsiders and the outcast and God's purposes to lift up the lowly. Now we're going to turn to scripture I didn't read, and we're just going to read one verse. It's in Mary's Magnificat. Remember when she's with Elizabeth and she just starts singing, singing the glory of what's happening to her, and she says in verse 52, He brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. Man, throughout Luke, that ought to be the theme. Because you see it again and again. The reversal of who's in power. Take them down from the throne and lift up the lowly. The outsiders, the outcasts, the Zacharias, the Elizabeths, the Marys. Many who wouldn't appear to be the first choice, would be the logical choice, who didn't belong, who didn't seem to be enough. Even Jesus' choice of disciples highlights he favored unlikely choices. A tax collector, a zealot, fisherman. Jesus' disciples were who he chose to minister to and who he chose to minister through. Let me say that again. Jesus' disciples were who he chose to minister to and who he chose to minister through. That applies to us, too. He brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. Those words should be a promise and calling to each of us. God calls us to lift up the lowly as we follow Jesus and partner with God in bringing about the reversal described in that verse. Partner with God. Those are actually Adam's, Adam Hamilton's words, and I really like them. Partner with God. They really struck me when I read them. Zechariah and Elizabeth partnered with God, and they followed the angel's instructions regarding John. He was the messenger preparing the way for Jesus. Mary partnered with God when she said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. That's where we are today. How can we partner with God to lift up the lowly in our community? I'm going to give you an example. Let's go back to my story when I was five years old, right? When I was with all these kids, they could have easily said, go over there on the sidelines and sit down and watch. Guess what happened, though? That isn't what happened. One of our neighbor kids, Adrian Hardwick, remember Adrian said, Teresa, go in the outfield with me. So I'm going out there with my little mitt on. What's on this side? Out there with Adrian. I'm a quick learner, by the way. And I saw how he fielded the ball. I saw how he caught balls. Guys, I was, collecting, I was collecting flies right and left before they knew it. I was catching those, those balls in the air, and they were going, what's happening?
doing back there? Adrian's like, well, I don't know. Well, you know, I watched him. He made me feel like I belonged there. He took someone who felt lowly and lifted them up. I loved playing on that field. I still drive by that field once in a while and have such great memories. For years we played there and had a blast. And even as I had a dog, imagine that, I had a dog when I was seven. My dog came with me and sat underneath the tree and watched us play ball. I felt welcome there because of Adrian. He had a heart of Christ. He knew how to lift up the lowly. So how can we partner with God to lift up the lowly in our community? I think that's the question I want you to ponder this week. Really think about it. How can you lift up those who don't belong? Remember, Jesus entered this world on a lowly status. They, you know, that, that saying that when you go help somebody, you may be helping Jesus in disguise. He called his disciples then, and he calls us now to be followers that lift up the lowly. So I ask again, how can we partner with God to lift the lowly in our community, especially during Lent? How are you called into service in this space? Who is out there that you can be Adrian to them, like Adrian was to me? I'll have to call him now and tell him he's part of a sermon. Um, May you respond just as Mary did. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Amen. At this time, take a few moments of silence just to see where are you being called? How can you lift up the lowly? How can you reach and help someone who feels they don't belong, that they're on the margins? How can you do that like Christ would do? Take a moment and consider that before we go into the intercessory prayer. During the prayer, when I say, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to respond. Hear our prayer. Our Father, friend of the lowly, whether hungry for power and glory or hungry for a simple meal, we pray for all who are hungry. Show the mighty that you alone can satisfy their deepest need and feed the poor from the abundance of your good creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church in times of trial, whether tested by temp tempestuous change, tempted by safety of the status quo, whatever we are tempted by. 
give us a peace when anger and fear tre- threaten to divide us and challenge us. When we are too comfortable in the world, Lord, we ask you to make us uncomfortable again. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for leaders in high places, whether determined to help those who suffer or distant from the cries of the oppressed. Open their eyes to see your saving power at work. Open their ears to hear your prophet's call for justice. Open our mouths when we need to shout for justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, instruct us in the way we should go. Point out the outsiders, outcasts, and outlaws among us so we too can lift them up and show they belong. May steadfast love surround us always. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And as our acolytes come and take the light of Christ into the world, let's join our voices together in the closing hymn, for we will also take the light of Christ into the world. Our closing hymn is on the next page. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Please stand. Open your arms wide for your charge and blessing. The Almighty One has done great things for us. Go forth as servants of the Lord, who has pulled down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. I'm going to meet you in the fellowship hall. Chris!